we've, I've set that thing up several times and it'll sit there and stay right there where you can sing into it. And as soon as you go to use it in a church service, don't the microphone won't stay. But, uh, that was good. Back at chapter number three. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Yeah. The Lord's been good to us. We're actually going to get into that later tonight. If you're having trouble like me finding it, say the books of the Bible. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Found it. Back at chapter number three. Mikey came up to me after the service today and said, when are you, me, and Unky going to march around the church? <laughs> I said, well, I haven't talked to Unky yet, but uh, we'll have to find a time to walk around the church and he goes out here on leaves. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, maybe. And everybody left and stuff. I finally got Aiden to walk out there with me and I carried around the garbage can of the Ark of the Lord. Mikey wanted the sword and Aiden whistled a We marched around the church one time for Mikey, so if you don't remember anything else from the message, at least you remember we marched around the church. Uh, back at chapter number three, we can read here in verse number 10. Back at uh, chapter three and verse number 10, if you're there, say amen. 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 It says, the mountains saw thee, and they trembled. He's prophesying here. The overflowing of the water passed by, and the deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun of the moon, and they're having, still in their habitation, at the light of thine arrows, they went, and at the shining of the glittering of thy spear, uh, at the shining of thy glittering spear, thou didst march through the land in indignation, thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, and for salvation of thine anointed. Thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Selah. Thou didst strike through the stage of the head of his villages. They came out of a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled to myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade uh, them with his troops. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Let's pray to the Lord. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, Lord. Thank you for watching over us, keeping us safe. And thank you, Lord, for this morning, God, your service. Uh, these servants, Lord, I pray, God, you'd help us, Lord, to keep on marching around Jericho to keep doing the things we're supposed to do. And, Lord, tonight, I want to talk about how to have rest in the day of trouble. And, uh, Lord, uh, our country's in a state of trouble. The lost world always has been in a state of trouble. It's nothing new. Uh, but, Lord, your people as a whole now seem to be uh, experiencing more trouble, God, and it's not so much more persecution right here in America, but, uh, Lord, just trouble with burdens, God, and, uh, Lord, I pray tonight, God, you'd help us, Lord, just uh, have a safe haven of rest, Lord, here in the sanctuary. And God, I pray, Lord, you'd help your people tonight, Lord, through your book, through your word. We ask it all in Jesus Christ's name, and amen. 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 Uh, a lot of preachers appreciate all those texts, and I'm sure you've heard the verse before. I believe even our pastor actually have his, an outline from him, uh, from this text. Uh, he preached out of what to do when God is silent. And uh, Habakkuk here talks about God being silent, and he preaches other things out of it. And I'm going to preach on that idea that I might rest in the day of trouble. Now, little is known about Habakkuk. Uh, he prophesied around the time with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called to make one of the major prophets, and that doesn't mean that his message was any better than Habakkuk's. It just means that God gave Jeremiah more revelation. Uh, he opened up uh, visions to Jeremiah more, and yet Jeremiah has uh, over 50 chapters, I believe. Habakkuk only has three, and they call those the minor prophets. Uh, most of your minor prophets talked about judgment. Their messages were 90% negative. They just talk about the judgment of God. A lot of them have second advent um, verses in them. Um, and the book is 90% negative, uh, just like most prophets were. It also has a second advent passage in it and a reference to Joshua chapter 10 verse 12. We haven't gotten to it yet. But in Joshua chapter 10, uh, they need to kill a lot of people. And they don't have enough time to do it before the sun goes down. So God actually holds the sun still. 
And uh, Habakkuk has a reference to that, and we'll, we'll run that reference later in our study through Joshua. Now, the man Habakkuk is having an internal struggle. He's trying to understand how God is just and merciful if he allows the heathen to chastise his own people in judgment. But he also chastises the heathen in judgment. Have you ever wondered why God allows the heathen to persecute his own people? And yet, he's judging the heathen as well. But he allows the heathen to take out vengeance on his own people to, to put them in bondage. And Habakkuk, throughout all of Habakkuk, we're not reading all of it, but he's struggling with that idea of God, you're merciful and you're a just God, and I know that you are, but I'm having trouble understanding why things are going on right now in my country. I'm having trouble understanding why things are going on with your people. Uh, we don't know a lot about him personally, but spiritually, he was more concerned with the holiness of God being vindicated or brought out, defended, demonstrated. He was more concerned with the holiness of God being brought out than that his own people should escape chastisement. In other words, Habakkuk's saying, I'd rather God's righteousness and holiness be displayed than for us to just get off easy. That's a spiritual man, isn't it? Whenever you can say, God, we deserve this. I don't understand why you're doing it to this extent, but Lord, we, we deserve your judgment. God, I'd rather you be seen as holy and just and all-powerful than for us to just get off scot-free. Now, that's a spiritual man right there. And in other words, he's, he's saying, God, he's saying, I'd rather, you, I'd rather you get the glory out of my life than for things to be easy. He's saying, God, I'd rather think, this is what he's saying, I'd rather your judgment be carried out than for you to just let us off the hook. Habakkuk didn't want rest from trouble. He wanted rest in trouble. He didn't say that I might rest, verse number 16, from the day of trouble. He said that I might rest in the day of trouble. He doesn't mind. We're trying to look at this thing. We're going to look at our country and different things. Brother Frank talked about this morning. And we're just going to look at a few things. But Habakkuk's in a place where his country had a revival just a generation ago. A revival. And now they're at a place where they've forgotten the word of God. That, that, that we're going to find out that the law is not being carried out. They're not carrying out the judgment of God. And Habakkuk's saying, God, we need you to move now. And Habakkuk didn't say, I want to rest from trouble. I want to get out of trouble. I want the judgment of God to stop. He's saying, God, the judgment of God's coming. Your judgment's coming. I just want to learn how to rest while it's coming. There's two ways to pray. Kind of confusing, really, if you think about it too long. But you pray for God to be merciful and for God not to bring down His wrath upon people. But then at the same time, you pray, God, you're just God. And we have been sinning as a country. So-and-so has been living a life of wickedness, God, and you are just, and just judge, or a judgmental God, so God, you may need to chastise them or our country for them to get right. And that's how Habakkuk is praying. Now, Habakkuk is praying, God, I don't care about getting out of it. At this point, I see that it's coming. Habakkuk's already prayed for the judgment to, with, to hold. We're going to get into this. I'm going to edit myself. He's already prayed, God, be merciful. And now he's at the point where he sees the end of things, and he sees how his country's going to go, and he says, God... Go ahead. He's kind of saying, God, I'm kind of done with the heathen anyway. I'm kind of done praying for him and interceding for him, God. I see what you're going to do anyways at your second advent. You're just going to, and after all that, you're just going to burn everything up. God, just go ahead and carry out your righteous judgment. But God, while you're carrying it out, help me to live in a state of rest and ease. And that ought to be your nice prayer. Now, I just want to give you four things tonight. It's only four points with 20 sub points each. Of how to have rest in times of trouble. How to have rest in time of trouble. See, just four simple points. There's a lot of sub-points down there. Uh, how to have rest in a time of trouble. If we're going to have rest in a time of trouble, number one, we need a, a divine burden. A divine burden. Turn over to Habakkuk chapter number one. And all these, all these points are going to come from the text itself. Habakkuk number one, verse one. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Notice he has spiritual discernment. We need people with spiritual discernment. And, he, and he's burdened about something. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? God is silent to him. Even cry out unto the violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up, raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth not go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Where, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Does that sound like any country that you know? He says, God, there's a lot of spoiling and iniquity in my country. Now, I know this isn't what spoiling means, but I'm going to apply it this way. He's talking about spoiling. Something's going, it's going bad, going rotten. But we got a lot of spoiled Americans, don't we? we got a lot of spoiled Americans and, and violent Americans. 
by the countrymen. He's saying, God, I'm looking at the spoiling of this nation. I'm looking at the iniquity. And he says there's violence in, my, in the country. He said there's slacking of the law. Verse number four, man, and the law isn't carried out, both nationally and individually. He's saying, God, that because the law is slack, meaning he's meaning the country is not getting the law and being just and making right judgments and, and carrying out the law of God and executing judgment upon uh, the, the, uh, the breakers of the law. And he said, and the reason they're not doing that is because the people individually aren't doing it. Can I say this? A government's always a reflection of the people. I'm not saying you and me. I hope we're not a reflection of our government. But the people as a, as a, as a whole... The overall government is a reflection of the overall people. You know God gives man what he wants? You, hey, you want everything to be free? You, you want college to be free? You want health care to be free? You want your car to be free? You want to make the same money as everybody else? That's fine, but just so you know, they're going to take over. They're going to rule you like a dictatorship eventually. You'll be communistic. You can have it all free, and you can live like China where they have 100 people stacked up in these big, huge towers. They can't even fit everybody. And you're, you're going to have water seeping through your roof. And you're not going to have any real health care system because it's all free. Whenever something becomes free, it usually lacks quality. You can get, I'll give you therapy for free if you want, but you're not going to get good quality for it. You ever went to a doctor for free? I hope not. I want a doctor that charges. It shows me that he's worth something. And you know what God says? He says, if you want, if that's what the thing that you want as a country overall, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you, like Brother Frank talked about this morning, a bunch of politicians that they're either Muslims, atheists, agnostics, and they don't even know the Constitution. Bless their little hearts. They, they, they want to talk about being outdated. You don't know what the Constitution is. Why do you say it's outdated? And he's saying, I see the lack of judgment being carried out by people, by the government. He said, what's happening to God's country and his people? They're spoiled, full of iniquity, not carrying out judgment, making wrong decisions. He says, therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Wrong judgment. Individually and nationally. You know, whenever someone comes before you as a judge, I'm not a judge and I don't pretend to be, but whenever someone comes before you and you say, uh, you, you're being charged today on the account of you killed three young girls, murdered them, and then raped them, and uh, how do you plead? Plead insanity, not guilty. Okay, I understand you're insane, but what we're going to do is there's a chair over here. And what we're, we're, we're going to vote. We're going to give you a trial, like the Bible tells us to do back in Exodus. That's where we get our judicial system from. It's where we get our three branches from. And we get our government from the Bible. We're going to give you a trial, and you're going to have a jury of 12. 12. Where's that number from, I wonder? Where'd they get a random number of 12 at? Huh. Anyway, we're going to give you a, a, a trial, and you're going to have a jury of 12 people to verify them out two or three witnesses. We're going to do it even better. We're going to give you 12. One reach tribe, children of Israel. But anyways... And uh, the man behind me, Moses, that uh, has the commandments, we actually got all this from him. But we're going to give you a trial. But after that, uh, I'm pretty sure you're guilty, but they'll vote on it. And I'll make the final decision. And then you're going to go sit in that chair and we're going to execute you. Now, I know you're insane. But we're not going to send you to an institution because you kill people. And are we sending you to that institution? We pay for you and pay a couple hundred thousand dollars a year more than the regular human being outside the institution. We're not going to pay that for you. You're actually, we're going to go over here and we're going to, we're going to kill you like the Bible says to do. That's good judgment. Or lethal injection. You'll be more humane about it. I, I don't know how you feel about the electric chair. You know, lethal injection, whatever. They used to take them out and stone them and, and different things. But uh, that's good judgment. You know what's not good judgment? Exact opposite of what I just said. Oh, you, 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 went, you killed three girls. You, oh, you're insane. It's t temporary insanity. So that means in a couple of months you're actually going to be healed through therapists and medicine. We're going to let you back out into society. Because you're only, you're only tempor temporarily insane. You know, you go over to that institution... And we're actually going to feed and clothe you and have armed, or we're going to have service around you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and pay STNAs, nurses, therapists, psychiatrists, because you haven't been working. So you actually don't have any insurance or anything like that, but the government will pay for your insurance. And we'll pay all the doctors and stuff and all your medicine. And we're actually going to put a couple hundred thousand dollars into you each year to keep you there. And then once you get back out, hey, I hope the best for you, man. That's wrong judgment. That's just not good judgment. And that's where they are, the children of Israel here in Habakkuk, and that's where we are as a country. And I can go on and on. I don't want to keep bringing out those things like that. But bad judgment. You know, I just see I see people individually making bad judgment. Just, I see people going, ah, oh, don't do that. Oh, please don't do that. And they do it. Just no judgment. Uh, God's judgment on a wicked nation is this. Wars and rumors of wars. This is how God judges a nation. He'll, he'll get you in a war, and there will be rumors of wars. That's over Matthew. Now, there will be famines. 
There will be pestilences. There will be earthquakes. There will be false prophets. And iniquity will abound. And the love of many shall wax cold. Wars and rumors of wars. You know for every year of peace in the world, there's been 13 years of war. For every one year of peace that you have in the world throughout history, you have 13 years of war for every one. Everybody says this book, oh, it's so bloody and so violent. Yeah, it's, it's a history book. And it's practical. It shows you how the world is. The rate of wars has increased since 1945. There's been over 300 wars since 1945. Since 1945, not one day has passed without some kind of war in the world. World of peace. How bless their hearts. Little UN. World peace. You guys are doing a great job of it. UN. Thank you all, UN, for the world peace you've been bringing. Every single day, there, there hasn't been one day passed where there's not war. 50% of uh, the world's scientists work on weapons research. You know, 50%, one out of every two scientists work on weapons research. Uh, there's not, there was not so many rumors of war until now with the mass media. The mass media helps you know about wars and rumors of wars. But the media, man, they'll tell you, did you see President or King John Moon, did you see him sneeze the other day? I think he has the COVID. I think he got it because Russia, Putin, gave him the COVID to try to start a war. And they just talk about rumors and rumors of war. Not going to happen. They've been saying we're going to go to war with China for 30 years. I know some of you got mad on that. I know China. I know they're red. I know they're commies. I know all that. But we haven't gone to war with them yet. And I know they keep saying we're going to go to war with China. We're going to go to war with China. Well, I mean, how long are you going to play that one for, honey? I mean, you're just going to keep singing that through the headlines? It's been in the headlines for 30 some years. We might eventually go to war with China, but that doesn't make you right. They've been saying we're going to go to war with China for 30 plus years. But God, whenever he wants to judge a country, judge a nation, judge the world, he'll bring wars and rumors of wars. He'll bring famines. And you know we're having famines uh, today. Food shortages because workers couldn't get um, get to the sellers or the sellers couldn't come and buy the things. You hear about all the milk they threw out. You heard about uh, farmers can't obtain seed or uh, get fertilized for their crops. <clears throat> My wife said the other day, uh, she saw that everyone saw about how the milk, they threw out all that milk. And now far, some farmers are saying they're actually making more money. Because now people are buying more ice cream, staying home and eating it. So a couple of farmers said we're actually selling more ice cream than what we ever have. But famines, there are famines. Uh, there was a bunch of locusts over there in Africa and Asia that were killing a bunch of crops just a couple of months ago. And uh, the Somali government was trying to take things out there and pesticides to kill them and couldn't. Uh, so he'll send famines to the country. He'll send pestilences. Pestilences like a sickness. Uh, you say, I don't believe in the COVID. Okay, do you believe in the flu and pneumonia? Those are pestilences. Those are sicknesses. And people do die from the flu. I you at least admit that. If you don't believe in the flu, then do you at least believe in pneumonia? Do you believe that's a real sickness? Yep. Okay. There are pestilences in the world. Uh, pestilences, sicknesses like STDs. You know, I read the stat today. I didn't know it was that high. You know, there's one million every day acquired STDs that they find. There's over 375 million STDs, confirmed cases, STD, new cases of STDs every year. Over a million a day of STDs. You say, what is that? God's judgment on a wicked nation, on wicked people. Uh, AIDS, I, look, I read in AIDS, over 76 million people have been infected with AIDS, 33 million dead. AIDS. I hope you know how that came about. It's not what they teach nowadays. Um, earthquakes. You know how many earthquakes there's been? Since 1890 to 1910, in 20 years there, 1890 to 1910, there were four record, recorded earthquakes. Since 1910 to 1930, there were four killer quakes. Killer quakes. Um, so serious ones. From 1930 to 1950, there were nine. From 1950 to 1970, remember the 60s there and 70s when the hippie movement came big and you had the Beatles? You know, they're not that bad. I mean, they're well-dressed. I mean, they wear ties and everything. They're not that bad. Well, isn't it kind of weird? No one ever seemed to notice that there were women pulling out their hair and screaming to go and hear them and Elvis. It sounds a lot like devil possession, don't it? But they're just some good old British boys in a different shirt and tie. Well, it sure has... Degressed since then hasn't. In the 1950s and 1970s, uh, 20 years, there's been 22 earthquakes. It went from 4 to 4 to 9 to 20, 2. From 1970 to 1980, that's only 10 years, there were 64 killer earthquakes. From 1980 to 1998, about 20 years, there were 200 killer earthquakes. God, and God wants to judge, you know, we judge people, how are we? Doing? God says, I'll just open up the middle of the earth and just shake everything and kill a bunch of them. But well, that's judgment on a nation that's forgotten God. Many false prophets, he said, will go out. You know false prophets is a sign of God's judgment? He said, I'll let you be deceived if you want me to see. Benny Hinn, 
There's a video I watch of uh, Benny Hinn, and there's a, a rock song. It's not a good rock song, but a lot of people listen to, to lose weight. But the, the song's called Let the Bodies Hit the Floor. Let the Bodies Hit the Floor. And the, the whole idea is that you know, they start screaming. They're going, it's like heavy metal. But someone put a video of Benny Hinn healing people to that song. <laughs> so it's got Benny Hinn going up to a guy, and, it's going, and that guy's standing there with a couple men. And it's got Benny Hinn going, Let the body. And you hear it, Let the Bodies Hit the Floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the. And then he goes like that, and the man goes, Pah! and they start screaming, oh! and that guy goes, you fall out to the floor. And then he's taking, he's taking his jacket and throwing it on people, and they're falling out, hitting the floor, and singing that song. Let the body is drumming and everything like that. It's, it's kind of funny. Uh, someone said he goes up to people and helps go up and kind of do this to their face, and they fall down like this. And someone said, uh, if I went around slapping people in the face and hitting them with my jacket, they'd arrest me. But he goes around, and doesn't, and he gets millions of dollars for it. Uh, but anyway, he's a, he's a false prophet. Uh, there's another man I was watching that one time, uh, it's uh, over in Africa, I think it was, but he has a, a Pentecostal charismatic, and uh, he had a big balcony of people, thousands of people in down there, and his, his message was, do you want the power of the Holy Ghost? Do you want the power of the Holy Ghost? He goes, take it! Like that. And a couple hundred of them just fall down in their chairs. And then he goes, you want the power of the Holy Ghost? You want, and they're playing drums up the bar. You want the power of the Holy Ghost? He goes, take it! Like that, and then a couple other hundred people go down. And then he goes up to the balcony and he goes, Do you want the power of the Holy Ghost? He goes, You want the power? He goes, Take it! Take it! Like that, people are just falling down. Idiots. Bless her. I mean, deceived people. I'm sorry, I should say idiots. Fools. Deceived. And folks, there are millions of people listening to them. And you and I look at that and say, Oh my God, do you have like a less violent like way to heal me or less violent religion? And, uh, but I mean, you have Jehovah's Witnesses. They go door to door. You know what tanks the door to door ministry? It's not the fundamentalist movement. That didn't tank the door to door ministry. What tainted the door to door ministry was Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. They see us come by and they think that that's who we are. Again, false teachers. That's one of God's false prophets. One of God's judgment. Iniquity abounding. Uh, you can look at a bill. You can't look at billboards anymore. People run around literally naked in public. Nakedness in the Bible is defined as anything above the knees and showing off the chest. And it shows off the chest. I wish that that was all that people showed when they walk around in public. We just went to Kroger the other day, and anyway, I'll stop it stop there. Anyways, uh, iniquity abounds. The love of many shall wax cold. You want to know how cold people are nowadays? We went for the tent meeting and passed out over 200 flyers. A group of people over several weeks, we passed out over 200 flyers. i say we met with people personally, about over 50 of them. My wife and I met with one lady and she started crying, talking about what hardship she was going through and how she was going through problems with her husband, her children, all these different things. And uh, I'm talking about how to have rest in the day of trouble. I'm talking about God's judgment on a nation. I'm talking about the love of many shall wax cold. That's how God says, I'm gonna, yeah, that's how it's going to be in the last days. And we we're crying, we we're praying to this girl, we give her a hug and stuff, invite her to church, we get her number and everything, and she never does show up. You know, the 200 flyers we passed out, not one person showed up. And think about it. We weren't going up to him saying, you need to get right. You know, the problem is, you need to get right in the church. We were going up to him saying this, we'd love to have you out at our church services. we got a little country church down the road on Irvin Road. We'd love to have you out. We're having a tent meeting. Rodriguez family is singing. Look at these kids here, 13, you know, 13 kids. They're going to be singing. Brother Paul will be preaching. We'd love to have you out. And you would think out 201 may show up and be like, you know, I think I do need to go to church. And they seem really nice. I should probably go. You know, not one of them came. We did have visitors from the community, but they weren't any of the ones that we knocked on their door. That's usually how that goes. God sends in other people for the ones that you go and get. But the love of many shall wax cold. People are waxing cold. That's God's judgment on a nation. That's how it is right now for Habakkuk's time. And it's like that nowadays. And you know what God's judgment is on an individual that's not keeping his law, that's going slack on his law? Depression and anxiety. And let me say that real carefully. Because I believe depression is real and I believe anxiety is real and I believe if you're taking medication for it, you should take it. I believe if you need to go to counseling, you should go to counseling. I believe if you need a therapist, you should go to a therapist. Don't come to me. Don't be one of the people that goes and throws out all your pills because I said you're not close to God or God's judging you because you're a wicked person. I'm not saying that. I, I believe I, I have a mental health background. I believe in mental health. I, I think people need it. If, you know, if you've dealt with some people I've dealt with, you would realize they need it too. I sat there with men and they told me there at the mission what their parents have done to them. What their siblings have done, and what their uncles have done. I, 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 I shoot heroin up since the age of eleven. They need a little bit more than "thou shalt not." So I don't don't get me wrong, but did you know one out of six Americans are taking antidepressants? 
Did you know God can judge an individual by bringing stress financially? You ever thought about this? You could have two people with the same financial situation, same number of kids. One of them stressed out about their finances and the other one isn't. Why, why is there a difference between the one that's calm and collected about their debt and the other one that's stressed out worried about always feeling behind, always feeling worried and anxious about it? You know what God does? He says, I want to give you things in your life and I'm either going to be with you during them or I'm going to be alone. You're going to be alone during them. And you can have the same per the same per two people could go to the hospital. One has peace while they're in the hospital and the other one's stressed out while they're in the hospital. And you know what God says? He says, if you're going to live wicked, he says, I'm going to leave you alone. I'll leave you alone. And he's, he, what he usually does is he leaves you to right in here. Where you're between your mind, between your ears, and all of your problems stuff that come in. And he just says, yeah, I'm not going to give you peace of mind, peace of heart. That's God's judgment on an individual. God's judgment on an individual. If all else, God will let you live a normal life, but he'll let you go through it alone if, if you're living wicked. I don't believe this. You ever heard someone say that if you don't tithe and give offerings, your car will break down? Anybody ever heard that? They say, if you rob God, Malachi 3.10, if you rob God, tithes and offerings, uh, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your, your dryers won't go out of your house. My parents have tithed and gave offerings for 40 years, and we've had dryers go out. We've had cars break down. That's not a doctrinal thing. We're not in the Old Testament under the law, and if you don't give your money financially, he hurts you, he, he brings judgment on you physically. But I do believe this. If you're living right for God and your car breaks down, you'll have a better spirit while it's broken down. Mm -hmm. Brother Will, you look at your car breaking down as God just must have wanted me to stay at this church and come back another night. Yeah, it was a blessing. He got to come back the second night. It got home Friday night. He's preaching on eternal security. And it was a good meeting uh, Friday night. And Brother Will got to be there because the Lord let his car break down. Now, I know this. I know whenever you're not walking with the Lord and you're not in, you're not spiritual and you didn't read your Bible that day, I know whenever your car breaks down, you have a little bit of a reaction you. Not Brother Will, I'm talking about me or the average person, but many of God's people are burdened down by things that God never intended them to bear. If we're going to have rest in the time of trouble, we have to be burdened down about what God's burdened about. Habakkuk is burdened about God not getting the glory in his country. Habakkuk is burdened about people who are not living right. Habakkuk is burdened and wanting a comforting word from God and to know that God is still in control. You know that's a good burden to have? You know there's good burdens that you and I are supposed to bear, like care for our country and that God's not getting the glory in our country, uh, care for individuals that aren't living right or they're not saved or they're not in church or they're not. That's a good burden to have. That's a right burden to have. But folks, there's a whole list of burdens that Christians get caught up in that God never intended you to have. I bring that up all the time about social media, YouTube, and Facebook, and all that stuff. But all of that stuff does, it brings burdens in your life. Conspiracies and things. And you say, where are they really going on? I know they're going on. Why do you have to know about it? <laughs> I mean, what, like, why do you have to know? I got real quiet there. Why do you have to know about all the things that are going on in the world? I just talked to a man the other day. He said, Aaron, you ever seen this on Facebook? And he showed me some big conspiracy thing about something going on with sex trafficking or something, this and that. I said, no. I said, I don't get on Facebook hardly. I hate that for the sex trafficking. I hope it's not real. I hope it's just a big hoax, but I'm not burdened about it because I'm doing other things. I'm trying to help, you know, do different things like that. Habakkuk is burdened about what God's burdened about. Souls going to hell, that's a good burden to have. Saints at the judgment seat of Christ, that's a good burden to have. You know, you and I should have a burden to see each other at the judgment seat of Christ be successful. <laughs> We were praying down there earlier this uh, or tonight, and I, I was praying for someone in the church, and I, I said, Lord, I want to see them in the judgment seat of Christ just get blessing after blessing, reward after reward. You know what Paul's burden was for his churches? That at the judgment seat of Christ, they'd be like a fatted calf, man. They'd, just, they'd have all the richness, all the blessings, and that God would just, they'd give an account of themselves, and they'd stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul said, you are rejoicing in the day of Christ. Paul's burden was to see other saints grow and get help. And witness and, and, and be faithful and grow spiritually. So that way the judgment seat of Christ, they wouldn't be naked and ashamed. They could stand there boldly. I don't know about you, but I like seeing other people succeed. I love watching other people get on fire for I love watching other people uh, testify and do stuff for the Lord. I love watching those things. Those are good burdens to have. To live righteously, that's a good burden to have. Being a light in a dark world, that's a good burden to have. A wayward family member or a brother or sister in Christ, those are good burdens to have. If we're going to have rest in a time of trouble, we have to be burdened about what God's burdened about. We need a divine burden. Ask yourself this. The next time you're worried about something, God, are you as burdened about this as I am? 
are you as burned about this thing as I am? You know what I, on vacation, it was raining Tuesday morning, and you know I never did pray for it to stop raining. Because you know what I said, Lord, I don't think you're real burdened about our vacation. I, I just don't think you're real burdened about it. And I've got much other bigger things to pray for, I guess. Lord, if you want it to rain today, that's fine. I'm not even going to pray for it to stop raining. I thank you for the rain. I didn't worry about it. I didn't sit there and go, oh, we're going to be able to go hiking today. What an awful day. Or we, we blew the money. Was it? No, just whatever. That's a simple example, but whenever you ask yourself, say, God, are you as burdened about this thing as I am? It'll help you put things in the right perspective. By the end of the chapter, Habakkuk is singing and rejoicing. We're going to get to it in a minute. He's saying all that news that you gave me was depressing about the country and judgment of God and different things. I know. But by the end of it, Habakkuk is singing and rejoicing. If you're going to have rest in a time of trouble, you need, number one, you need to have a divine burden, a burden from God. And number two, you need a dictated book. A dictated book. Look over in chapter two. Habakkuk chapter number two. Habakkuk 2, uh, Habakkuk 2, verse number 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he shall say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the table that he may run that readeth it. You need a dictated book if you're going to find rest in the time of trouble. The word dictated, all that means is just delivered with authority. It's ordered and directed, meaning it's not optional to follow. You know, we have a book that's been given by an authority. We have a book that's been given by an authority. And he orders us to follow it. If we're going to have rest in the time of burden, you need a dictated book. Look what verse number one says about the book. He says, watch to see what he will say unto me. I will watch to see what he will say unto me. You know, that would be something. You know what to do in a time of trouble? Is to wait and see what God has to say to you. Habakkuk, hey, keep this in mind, man. He has no Facebook to go to. He has no YouTube to go to. He's not calling up Brother Jeremiah on the phone and saying, Jeremiah, what do you think? What's it like over there where you're at? How are churches doing things over there? How's your family? Jeremiah, are you sick? Are you coughing? Do you have a fever? Do you have a runny nose? Do you have shortness of breath? Do you have nausea, hot, heartburn, indigestion? Do you have a sore stomach, sore throat, throat sore eyes? Do you have a sore toe? Jeremiah, have you or any of your loved ones? He didn't call anyone to do that. You know what he did? He said, I'm going to sit and wait. And see what God has to say unto me. Wouldn't it be something if we just went to God's Word and we said, God, I'm stressed out as can be, I'm worried as can be, I'm going to read this thing until you bring me peace. You know, I got tired of uh, going through my daily Bible reading, reading 10 pages a day and not getting anything from it, so I quit doing that years ago. And then I read a couple chapters here and there, but I, I finally said, I said, I'm not going to leave until God gives me a word from the Scripture for the day. Something small, something large, it can be a reprovement, a rebuke, or an exhortation. But until he says something, until I hear him speak from the book, I don't want to leave it. And you know how Habakkuk says, he says, I'm going to watch to see what he will say to me, and what shall I answer when I am reproved? You know something about Habakkuk? He was teachable. He said, I want you to te reprove means to teach. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort following suffering and doctrine. Men will tell you, a preacher will say, bless God, my ministry is two-thirds negative. Reprove and rebuke, and then exhort. It's not two-thirds negative. Your ministry is not two-thirds negative. Reprove means to teach. You can find that in Proverbs. Next time you go through Proverbs and you're doing daily Bible reading, look at the verses where reprove and instruction are in the same uh, uh, verse. Reprove has to do with instruction. Reproof has to do with teaching. Teaching is one of the hardest things to do. Learning is one of the hardest things to do. And you know what Habakkuk says? He says, Lord, teach me as a grown man what I need to do in this time of trouble. What if we all were so obedient we were just waiting to respond to the Word of God every time we read it? I'll give you an illustration before. And uh, Brother Frank mentioned this morning about obeying the Bible and believing it are two different things. Uh, uh, obeying the Constitution and believing it are two different things. He brought that out. Uh, but obeying the Word of God, there was an old black deacon. I've told you this before, but uh, the pastor said for a meeting, he said, Brother so-and-so, he said, come on up here and pray for us. Give us the opening prayer. And that deacon walked up, and they, they usually have their, they have those suits with like five buttons on them. They go down to about their knees, and they button it all the way up. They usually have, you know, cuffling and different things. They had a nice watch on, and, uh, nice glasses and everything, and looking good. And he comes up, and he goes, mm -hmm. Everybody's real quiet, their heads bowed. And, and I'd say, people are going, Lord, and Lord. That's just how I'm imagining. And he goes, Yes! 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 And all 
old people went, yes. And he went, yes. And they all went, yes. Like that. And he called and he said, Lord, you have our answer. Now tell us what you want us to do. You know that'd be something where we come to the house of God or we open up the word of God in the morning and say, God, it's Monday. What are you going to do today? God, that Sunday morning, uh, Sunday night, Lord, I don't even know what I need. Can you just give me something from your word? I guarantee this, when you come to the word of God, to the house of God, looking for something, you'll find it. Those that seek me early shall find me. We need a, a dictated book. We need a divine version. In verse number two, look what it says in verse number two. It says about this word, it says, write the vision. It's a written word. Man wrote it. Or man didn't write it. God had, God had man scribe it down, but it's inspired of God. But it's a written word. I had a man say down here in Hillsboro on Walnut Street, he said, I don't believe, uh, I believe man wrote the book. So, good job, you're a great theologian. Man did, he penned it down with his hand, but God told him what to write. God had his word written down. Notice it's a plain word. Make it a plain upon the tables. That means anyone can understand it. I don't know about you, but I think the Lord, he wrote the Bible in a way that we can understand it. You know the Bible is so delicately written? And you keep it the King James Version, you don't get the new version. Whenever it talks about things that are kind of, you don't know if you want a young kid to know or a young child to know before a certain age, it words it in a way where he can't, he or she can't understand it. That's how the King James, that's how they wrote it. It's written in a way where they can't pick up on it until they get a little bit older and you know, they're able to comprehend them and things. And God, uh, it's plain so anyone can understand it. You know a child can understand the Bible? And then notice that he says that he may run that readeth it. He may run that readeth it. You know what I write sometimes in uh, my notes whenever I'm preaching? I have a couple points down, and then I'll write in there, run with it, Aaron. And what that means is, is if you're feeling, if you feel liberty to do so, I mean, get on with it. I mean, I'm talking clap. I'm talking, I mean, I'm give it your all. Run with it, Aaron. Give it all you've got, man. You get, get, give, them, give them the picture. I don't even want to call it a show. Just give them all you got. I'll write it there. Run with it, Aaron. Whenever I feel a point's just good and it just it blessed my heart while I was studying and preparing and writing it down, it's one of those points where I go, whoa, that's a good one. Uh, they may not like it as much as me, but I'll write down my notes, run with it, Aaron, with an exclamation point. You know what he says here? He says that he may run that readeth it. What that means is he, the one that reads this word, the word that I'm going to give you, the written word, the plain word, write it away, Lord, that whenever I read it, I can run with it. I can give it to someone else. It'll be easy for me to explain to someone else. You know the word of God's easy to explain to people? It really is. 